down in a hallway, Decker and Montgomery step out of a turbo lift and Decker fakes a cough. Star Trek fight! The whole time during this fight, I kept looking at the carpet and thinking, someone needs to vacuum the carpet. <laughs> I don't know why. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, like when you're a kid and you, like your mom would vacuum in a pattern and yeah. didn't want anyone to step on it. And and I'm like, oh, look at uh, these cuff marks are driving me nuts. Someone vacuum that carpet. Perhaps I could use this as an excuse to go to those far off planets with little polka dotted people if necessary and be able to talk about love, war, nature, God, sex, all those things that go to make up the excitement of the human condition. I'm Captain James Kirk. It's Spock. You move, Captain. Jim Kirk of the Enterprise. What's going on? I'm James Kirk. These people are my friend and my shipmate. Leave my crew alone. Out of the question. How about that? James Kirk. It fits like a glove, Captain. Oh, the bonehead ideas. Gentlemen, I'm Captain James Kirk. <laughs> Get out of my chair. Get out of it now. My greetings and felicitations, Captain. So good of you and your officers to uh, <laughs> drop in. Absolutely smashing. Joel on True, everyone, and welcome to Humanist Trek. It's a Star Trek podcast about the humanism in Star Trek. I'm Sarah Ray. And I'm Allie Ashmead. And uh, you may recall, recently we talked about the solar panel drama. <laughs> I have new drama. <laughs> new house drama. <laughs> I have some too. So we're going to do the landscaping in the backyard. I don't know if I've mentioned this on the show before or not, but the house that we bought, we bought a new construction in a stupid HOA neighborhood and because that's just how it worked out. Anyway, and uh, oddly, one of the things that the builder is not responsible for is the backyard. So they landscape everything that's like, you know, street side, visible, yeah, outside your fence. And then... Everything else in the you know the backyard is is your responsibility, which you know I assume lowers the cost of the house a little bit. But then you have to spend that money anyway to do the backyard. And there's some pros and cons, right? Like I I like that it gives you the opportunity to do it the way you want to do it. Because mm-hmm. when we had our house built in Florida, they did do the backyard and they planted whatever trees they wanted to plant wherever they wanted them. And I right. ended up having to like rip out trees and plant new ones and make it what I wanted it to be, right? Anyway, so we got a quote from our guy who's done all of our all of our work. And what we really wanted was AstroTurf. Now, I don't know if you know this, because I sure It's really didn't. hot. It's, it's really fucking hot. It's real fucking expensive. So yeah, the, area, like the area we were going to put in was 4,744 square feet. It was like 50-some thousand dollars. Just it's outrageous for AstroTurf. And, you know, it was like, or you can get, you know, and that's like a low quality or, you know, you, you can sometimes get used ones from like football fields and stuff. Like a, <laughs> that would be cool. Resale. They have some stripes on their back. <laughs> 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 well, it turns out Becca just saw on next door marketplace or one of those, whatever. Uh, one of our local schools is selling their AstroTurf. Hmm. Like, oh, no shit. Okay. Hmm. Huh. Anyway, the only, so we the were only like, thing is about I don't know if you know about astroturf turf is about how much heat it mm-hmm. generates. Yeah. So that's a definite con. Mm-hmm. But I ain't gonna mow it. So that's a pro. That's, that's true. <laughs> true. 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 <laughs> anyway, we don't have fifty thousand dollars to spend on turf for the backyard. So uh, we came back and said, "All right, do it all again. Then this time, do it with sod instead." And that came back, and we were like, "Oh wow, we can't afford that either." Uh, oh, shit. <laughs> what are we going to do? Get some rocks. Well, so that was the next plan. The next plan was, okay, we'll just rock the whole damn thing. The only We need a little patch for the dog to go pee on somewhere. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, then we don't have to water it, mm-hmm. right? It's, no mowing. It's all hardscape. I don't have to, to water it either because that was the, it included with the cost was the irrigation and all that stuff. And so we got that figure back and we're like, okay, maybe not rock. Uh, let's do a three foot rock border around the edge of the fence, Mm -hmm. irrigate my vegetable garden area, and then mulch everything else. The cheapest fucking mulch you can find. So -hmm. that's, I think, the direction we're going to have to go to be able to afford to do it. You just have to keep the weeds out of the, inevitably it will come through the mulch. And then you got to mulch though every year, I think, because it kind of disintegrates, but Yep. Still probably better than grass. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then 
you know, when we want to expand and do the next step of the project, you know, the next thing we wanted to do, but couldn't, then we can yeah. rake it up and readjust. Yeah. Yeah. I had my own drama with rocks. <laughs> you have more drama. <laughs> than, I hope when we do pull the trigger on our project, I hope we don't have anything near what you've been going through. Yeah, the cops got called and everything. <laughs> so I don't know if I talked about this. I had a guy working on my um, backyard um, starting in like November. Um, basically, I had two large koi ponds and old deck that was rotting and lopsided. And a ton of trees in the backyard, all of which I'm allergic to, <laughs> as I found out. <laughs> and it was just a kind of a mess back there, uh, for my taste anyway. I think, like, for the previous owners, they kind of liked it like that. But I was like, I don't do fish and all that. So they started work in November to fill in the, the koi pond and then make me, like, a multi-level, really nice backyard. And then they removed, like... 14 trees and I've got um, another section of the backyard that's just nothing, which I don't know what to do with maybe a garden. So they started back on the work a few weeks ago because of all of the snow, they couldn't really do anything right. and get anything done. So I ordered this peat rock, which is this really tiny rock that's easy to walk on and you can put uh, furniture out there. And I thought, oh, that's, this is what I want. I want the little tiny rock. It's called peat rock. Yep. And I had ordered it a while back, but they finally were able to deliver it week before last. They tried to deliver it on a Wednesday. The landscaper was there to get the delivery. And before they dumped it, he's like, no, nope, this is the wrong rock. Mm -hmm. So he calls me out back and he's like, just want to confirm this is the rock that they sent. And this is the wrong rock. I'm like, yep, that's the wrong rock. So we ended up me and the landscaper talking to the delivery guy, just shooting the shit out in my backyard. <laughs> and he's on the phone to the guy that sold him the rock to say, okay, this is the wrong rock. He calls the company. Turns out they don't know who that guy is. Oh, shit. That sold him the rock. And he's got, well, I've got all his text messages. Let me send them to you. So he's on the phone. They don't know who he is. Whoever this guy was paid for the rock on a stolen credit card. Because of course out. he did. Yeah. And was just going to dump it in my yard, and then I would have to pay him, and then right, then he got, he's away with a bunch of money. Mm -hmm. And so it was a scam. Wow. So A good thing this guy was there to be like, nope, that's not it. Yeah, because. <laughs> <laughs> so all of that straightened out. The, the driver took the rock away. He hadn't dumped it in my driveway yet, so I was like, good. And took the rock away. The landscaper ordered another truckload of the right rock. That was delivered the next day in the evening as I was about to leave. I took delivery. He dumped it in my driveway. I've got the receipt. It's the correct rock. Great. So it's all ready for the landscaper to come next morning and spread it. Mm -hmm. The next morning, I was not aware that another truck comes in and dumps another load of rock oh, in shit. the street. Not in my driveway, but in oh, the street. There's shit. already a pile of rock, the correct rock, in my driveway. This guy just dr dumped the rock in the street. And we have really wide streets, so it's not in yeah. anybody's way. And then left. I didn't, I'm like, what the fuck? At first, I didn't know about it until the, the landscaper got there. And he's like, there's more rock. Who, who delivered <laughs> that rock? Where the hell did this come from? Right. And, it's, and it was still the wrong rock. Oh I didn't even gosh. need it or want it or I didn't pay for it. So they dumped it in, in trying to force me to take it. So the landscaper is like, I'm going to cover my ass and I'm going to call the cops. Yeah. <laughs> and so he calls the cops. I'm, I'm in and out because I'm on conference calls because I work from home. So the cops come to Aurora PD SUV blocking the street. <laughs> oh, My neighbors are like, what is going on at Allie's house? <laughs> Four cops are just, you know, chilling. You know how they like first they get out of the car and they saddle up. What's oh, the yeah. problem here? Uh -huh. And I'm like, oh, uh -huh. shit. And then I'm black. My landscaper's black. And I'm like, this looks really bad. <laughs> yeah. But no, he called the cops and he's like, look, I'm just trying to cover my ass. Here's what happened. We got scammed. This is the rock that we don't even want, but they dumped it anyway. Here's the receipt. I was like, here's the receipt for the other rock. Yep. And these guys are like, well, you know what? There's nothing you can do. And it's in your, it's on your property now. And as long as you do your due diligence and try to get them to come get it, which mm -hmm. they won't, we know they won't do. 
you do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> you got a free pile of rock out of the deal. I do. And it's and it's like, you know how expensive it is. Oh, yeah. P- plus delivery. Yeah. I have seven tons of rock. So, yeah, it's a lot of rock. So, like, we're going to use it. I mean. Yeah. But meanwhile, these cops are like, well, can can I see what you're doing in the back? <laughs> 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 we got four cops coming oh in my, my backyard God. and they're like loving it and um they're like this is nice oh, i love this and they were walking <laughs> all over my backyard and oh, we were awesome. talking about like what we've already done so that was the drama oh my god like in in three days but the the most of the rock is down but it's been raining so yeah we um, had a washout in ours so we've got to get our our landscaping in quick because it's Oh man! Everything is built here on like a fucking hill. They build it, build it up, and so that mm-hmm. you know, so that it all runs away from your foundation. Anyway, speaking of rocks, Drama. let's talk about Drama. a giant rock that eats <laughs> giant planet rocks. <laughs> that's the best I got. Oh yeah, that's right. That's perfect. It's Star Trek: The Original Series, Season Two, Episode Six: The Doomsday Machine. Sir, contact with an object. It's moving toward us. No visual contact yet. Reflectors, full intensity. What's the suit? Yes, Captain. Anything on your scanners? It's coming at light speed. Collision course. Visual contact. Anything to work? All wavelengths dominated by ionization effects, sir. All engines, full stop. This episode starts with the Enterprise responding to a distress call. The bridge is bustling with red shirts. Where the hell is Uhura? I know. She's some Lieutenant Palmer is at the comm instead of her. Yeah. So I broke our own prime directive and I looked it up. <laughs> apparently. Oh, yeah. Sorry, it wasn't a question, I don't think. Apparently, Nichelle Nichols had a singing engagement in New York. Oh. Which she she did from, you know, time to time during filming. Uh, so she just, like had the week off. So they had Elizabeth Rogers fill in as Lieutenant Palmer at comms. But I noticed right. I noticed her absence. Yep. The distress call was badly garbled, but she got the name Constellation, and it came from a solar system in this sector. But as they arrive to investigate system L370, they find that all seven planets in the system have been destroyed, leaving only its star and debris. Some time passes, and they arrive at system L374, and they're picking up similar debris here, but it appears that two of the inner planets are still intact. So Lieutenant Palmer still is picking up that disaster beacon, and Spock says that the sensors are now picking up a starship. Mm-hmm. And they, that's when they find the constellation heavily damaged and, and drifting in space. Kirk immediately thinks, oh, they've been attacked, so they immediately go to red alert. After the theme, we go around the horn. Sulu's got the weapons heated up. Palmer still can't raise the constellation and can barely pick up the distress call now due to the subspace interference. Spock has determined that their main power is out and reserves are low. Life support is barely running, and while the rest of the ship seems to have life support, the bridge is damaged and uninhabitable. So they decide to take an away team and a damage control team over to the ship to... to evaluate her and they leave Spock in command. So there's Captain Kirk, Dr. McCoy, Engineer Scotty, and then a few various other people. Scotty takes some of the staff and they do them. They go do some engineering stuff. Yes. And then McCoy and Kirk look for survivors and they don't really find any. So they decide, okay, let's go to the auxiliary control room and play back the captain's log. And then that's when they discover the only survivor and, and the only member on board, which is the ship's commander. He's a Commodore Matt Decker. And he looks and- like he's had his mind zapped by Bender. <laughs> oh, wait, you serious? Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> uh, totally. He's like <laughs> blank. And I- I'm like, why? So he's a Commodore and why is he commanding can- a starship? Yes. Why is Ag- he not a captain? Agreed. I had that question as well. I don't know that we have an answer, but... Yeah. Kirk tries to shout him back to consciousness while McCoy (laughs) hits him with a hypo. And he has to do that calm down, Jim. He needs a minute thing that we see so often. Matt can only get out that they were attacked by a ship. That thing, he says. But he can't really put it all into words yet. And he seems to be physically in pain trying to explain it. Scotty's got one of the backup logs loaded up in uh, Winamp. 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 It really whips the llama's ass. (laughs) That's so awesome. 
The constellation entered system L374. The fourth planet was breaking up. They went to investigate. Kirk interrupts the log to send Scotty to transfer all the data from the constellation to Spock for analysis. And then Decker says they tried to contact Starfleet, although he pronounces it Starfleet. The emphasis that he put on Star, not Starfleet, it's Starfleet. And they were unable to run, so he beamed his crew down and stayed on the sinking ship. But then something even more tragic happened. The enemy attacked again and knocked out the transporters. So Decker gets really emotional explaining how like he was getting all these phone calls from those 400 people on the, sh- on the planet as it was being destroyed, begging him to beam them the fuck back up, but he Ugh. couldn't. That made me think of like all the phone calls that went out of the the New York area and the mm. Twin Towers. 9-11, yeah. When 9-11 happened, yeah. Mm. That's got to be devastating, knowing, for him, knowing I sent those people down there mm-hmm. and and then they right into danger and they, they all died. Yeah. Uh, William Wyndham is the guy playing Matt Decker and I thought he was just great in this role. I thought he was fantastic. Honestly was, yeah, because I, I was like, I felt sorry for him, and then I hated him. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, he slumps over the desk in despair while Kirk walks away to get a report from Washburn. Something crashed through the deflectors and knocked out the generators, and the antimatter in the warp drive pods has been deactivated. Scotty confirms that the energy dampening field could have caused that and might also account for the subspace interference. And then Decker starts describing this thing again, arguing that the whole thing must be some kind of weapon. In miles, we're measuring now, not kilometers. Back in miles. It's miles long, with a maw that could swallow a dozen starships, destroys planets, chops them into rubble. And they've, it's got some kind of pure anti-proton beam. And I'm assuming maw, when they say maw... <laughs> yeah, mouth. <laughs> like, that's an old, and it's an old-timey word for yeah. mouth. Yeah, right. Kirk's StarTAC rings. Spock's on the line with some updates. They can't contact Starfleet Command either now, and the Constellation's tapes show that the attacker was some kind of planet-killing robot, an automated weapon of immense size and power, and he believes it replenishes its power by eating planets. Sulu has plotted its most likely course based on the planets it's destroyed so far and says that it came from outside this galaxy. And if it follows this course, it's going to go through the most densely populated part of our galaxy. Dun, dun, dun. So Kirk just comes out of the blue with this. Hey, have you ever heard of a doomsday machine? <laughs> and McCoy gives his McCoyism. He says, I'm, not, I'm a doctor, not a mechanic. Yes. But basically, Kirk's like, it's a weapon primarily built as a bluff. And it was actually never meant to be used and it's it's just a kind of thing that powerful countries did. And I think he likened it to the H-bomb. Yeah. Where we, we actually weren't go- supposed to use it, but it was just a kind of a bluff to say, I've got something powerful mm-hmm. to scare the other side into compliance. He thinks that this is a doomsday machine that was used in a war years ago, but its people are long gone and the machine continues killing. And Decker's like, Yeah, but what are you going to do about it? It's headed straight for the heart of our galaxy. And Kirk says, well, the first order of business is to get you back to the Enterprise. But Decker's being stubborn and doesn't want to leave. And the reason is truly heartbreaking. He says he's never lost a command before. Yeah. So his pride is, I mean, obviously devastated that he's gotten his whole crew killed. Yes. But his pride is taking a, a beating, too. So our plan is to tow the Constellation. McCoy and Decker beam to the Enterprise, and as they materialize, we hear Spock calling for red alert again. On the bridge, we learn that the planet killer is back, and it's coming right for us. My God, it's coming right for us! <laughs> it's a big space worm with a, with a fiery mouth. <laughs> uh, I don't know what else to call it. I, I think this was another great example of the remastering work that they did, because... The look of this thing in the remaster was great. I loved it. it. Yeah, it was. It was actually really, really good. And we see on the view screen that it is turning now to follow the Enterprise. More remastering goodness. We get a shot of the Enterprise with the constellation in tow. 
Although if they're using a tractor beam, we don't see it. Yeah. And which we usually see some kind of yeah, ray. Some kind of beam of light. And we get a fun shot of the planet killer chasing them. <laughs> on the bridge, Spock notes that they're more maneuverable, but it is gaining on them. No signs of life. And Kirk, who is still on the phone from the constellation, says that they have to figure out how to stop it before it destroys again. They have a conversation about their chances of deactivating the thing, which Spock thinks is unlikely. Mm -hmm. He says that their warp nacelles seem to be attracting it, so they likely couldn't get close enough without being attacked. And it's not likely they'll be able to access its controls easily. The beast right. is gaining on them, so Kirk decides they'd better beam back to the Enterprise. But before they're able to transport, the planet killer fires at them. They all do the jerk, and... I it actually looks like it it, t it tips the ship sideways mm -hmm. and it actually looks like did they have a way to like actually tilt the room because it literally looked like they were crawling up to try to get back in their seats. Oh, I did don't you know. notice that? Uh uh, no, I didn't. This one actually looked like they were actually sideways, but huh. I don't know. No, I didn't notice that. After the machine attacks, they lose Kirk on comms and they try to do evasive action but uh, no go they just it just keeps blasting them and they just keep having systems damaged they are able to eventually outrun it and they're working on repairing the Enterprise but then I guess it starts to veer off from them and turns towards the Rigel system yeah now we've heard the Rigel system before Mm -hmm. uh, in the pilot, wasn't it? That Pike was lamenting yes. his Rigel. command and it was right. It was a Rigel colony. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I think mm -hmm. we heard it again somewhere. Anyway, yeah. but now a new dilemma has also evolved. A power struggle between Spock and Decker. Oh, this was good. So we have Kirk, Scotty, and some UCs aboard the Constellation without any way to protect themselves. And meanwhile, Decker is demanding that they return an attack while Spock's cool logic suggests they should go back for the captain and regroup. One ship and a damaged one at that won't be so effective against this enemy. There's a lot of reaction shots around the bridge as this all kind of boils up to a head and <laughs> Spock orders Sulu back to the constellation and Decker orders Sulu to do a UE and prepare to attack. And Sulu's like, well, which do one do? do I? <laughs> what which do which I do? one do I listen to? <laughs> and yeah, Spock's being logical. He's like, their primary duty right now is to survive, mm -hmm. and and then warn Starfleet. Yep. But then Decker's like, well, no, our primary duty is to maintain life and the safety of the Federation planet. So we have we got to protect Rigel. But they can't. No. I mean, like they can't. They got nothing, and he failed to do so with his own ship so that was the best part spock calls decker out on his shit and points out like hey the last time you tried this you ended up with a fucked up ship and 400 people dead mm -hmm. so maybe we try my way yeah yeah mic drop decker thinks their problem was just that they weren't close enough but spock's like that object's hull is solid neutronium no single ship could destroy that but Decker pulls rank in the end, and McCoy's fit to be tied. He's like, fuck regulations. This is horse shit, and you know it. But this is what bothers me about McCoy. So mm -hmm. he's like, he's like, are you going to stand there and let this happen? Decker tells him, basically, get out of the fucking chair. Spock gets out of the chair, and Spock starts citing Starfleet regs to McCoy and says, unless you can declare him medically or psychologically unfit, he can't relieve Decker. And then here's McCoy's opportunity to back him up. Yeah. But he can't provide medical records to, so even if he said he was unfit, he have to provide medical records to back it up. And they don't have so, that. Yeah. So they're stuck with Decker. And then I think Decker says, tells McCoy to leave the bridge. Yeah. He's, Doctor, <laughs> you, you may leave the bridge. Yeah. This scene really gives me like the Captain Ahab chasing his whale vibes. Uh, oh, 100%. That this whole episode from here on is is Captain Ahab. Mm -hmm. um, and it also really showcases how young this crew is in their jobs, but also their relationships, because I feel like feature film era Enterprise crew would have had each one of them stand up one by one and refuse to follow Decker's orders. Yeah. Or they would have said, yeah, I'll go along with it. And then they don't. Right. Um, somehow. Yeah. But yeah. The Enterprise returns to the planet killer, and Decker is sitting in the captain's chair, like, playfully fidgeting with some floppy disks. 
Yeah. It was a weird choice. Back on the Constellation, Kirk is elbow deep in a panel trying to get the view screen on. And Scotty calls up with some bad news, good news, bad news. The bad news is the impulse engine control circuits are fried. The good news is that they'll have the warp drive control circuits are in good condition so they can cross connect them. The bad news is that it'll be nearly impossible for one person to handle the ship. Yep. And Kirk, Kirk. Kirk's line is so great here. So you worry about your miracle, Scotty. I'll worry about mine. And that <laughs> reminded me, that reminded me of an old Louisiana boy who I worked with at Disney who used, mm-hmm. who used to say all the time, it, anytime there was like my drama, your drama. Now, listen, son, you tend to your plate and I'll tend to mine. And Kirk is trying to get the view screen back up because it's driving him crazy the, to not know or be able to see what's what's happening out there. The Enterprise is making a run at the planet killer and it shoots its high energy beam at them. Deflectors holding but weakening and Spock continues to try to talk to Decker into a more reasonable course of action. But he's after that whale. Yep, he is trigger happy. But they do show some, again, some really good graphics because I yeah. know it's the, um, the reimagining <laughs> of it. And the little tiny Enterprise shooting this big ass yes. metal worm. I think it was great. Yeah, it was, it was really good. Cut back to the constellation. Kirk's finally got his little four inch TV working. And what comes on the screen is the Enterprise flying across the planet killer. <laughs> He's like, what the devil are they doing? <laughs> Phaser blast after phaser blast, no effect, and Spock urges retreat, and again, Commodore Ahab refuses. Kirk tries to ring Spock, but it's not getting through. Scotty's almost got impulse power online, and Washburn leaves Kirk to help out in engineering. The Enterprise takes another direct hit. Shields are gone now. Power failures all over. Casualties, hull ruptures. They're hit again, and now they're being held by a tractor beam that's pulling them inside the planet killer. And again, Spock tries to convince Ahab to try to escape. But Ahab right. is getting more and more desperate. And Spock's like, is, this is suicide, and it's this is proof that you're not fit for command. So mm-hmm. Right, so that was enough to break through to Ahab, and he orders Sulu to veer off, but it's too late. They don't have enough power. Back from the break, Kirk is watching on his four-inch TV as the Enterprise is being pulled in, and Scotty's got some impulse power ready now. The Constellation jolts on the takeoff, and everybody jerks. There were some fun audio effects here, too, as the ship struggles to get going. Yeah, you can tell, like, some kind of machine or vehicle that's struggling, it really actually felt like it, the way that they did the audio, and yeah. So what they have is not much, but it'll have to do. On the Enterprise, they're still trying to break free, but being pulled further in. Kirk voices his plan. Maybe they can get over there and get this thing's attention so that it will release the Enterprise. And he's like, oh, if I only had some phasers. And Scotty's like, (laughs) phasers, you say? I've got a phaser for (laughs) you. Again, not sure what the system of currency is here, but Kirk says, Mr. Scott, you've earned your pay for the week. Yeah, no idea. Yeah. Credits? I don't know. The Constellation licks a phaser shot at the Beastie, and it lets go of the Enterprise and turns towards the Constellation. Spock starts to suggest escape again, but Decker says, Kirk pulled us free, now it's time to return the favor. And they fire phasers and then move away. Spock seems to have discovered that there is some kind of automated defense that responds if you get within a certain distance from the Beastie, (laughs) And he reports that the warp drive and deflectors will be offline for a day, and they're working on repairs to transporters and comms, but the beastie is closing in on them again. And Sulu says it's sucking in the rubble from des- destroyed planets, which refuels itself somehow. They'll only be able to maintain this speed for seven hours before they exhaust their fuel, but the beastie can refuel indefinitely. Decker wants to attack and Spock logics against this, There's no way they can destroy it, so there's no way they can save the Rigel colonies. They have to rescue the captain, get away from this subspace interference, and and warn Starfleet. There was so much happening in the back and forth. Mm -hmm. Long story short, though, they finally got ship-to-ship communications back. So they reach Captain Kirk, and then Decker pulls this very immature thing where he refuses to give Spock the comm. Kirk is like, Mm -hmm. let me talk to Spock. 
So Kirk is like, so you're the lunatic that almost destroyed my ship? Yeah. And he pulls rank. He's like, you know, I'm highest ranking officer and I relieved Spock of command. But Kirk is still insisting on talking to Spock. He's like, no, I don't want to hear your bullshit. And he says, the only thing I want to say to you, Decker, is to get my ship out of there. And so then he asks Spock for a ship status. But then this was some shit, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in order to for Spock to talk to Kirk, Decker makes him come down to his chair and talk to him over here. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a way of like, again, pulling rank and making Spock feel small. The status is that the warp drive is out for at least a day. Shields down, transporter under repair. They're on emergency impulse power. Sulu pipes up and says, uh, the, the worm is on them again. They're gaining <laughs> them again. I don't know what to call this thing. And so Kirk is basically being a captain from the other ship. And mm-hmm. he, tells, he tells Sulu to take evasive action. But then Decker is like, wait a minute. I told you I'm in command. And we are going to attack. Kirk orders Spock to relieve Decker of duty, blast the regulations. Mm-hmm. Fuck that. Decker is like, I don't recognize your authority to relieve me. And Spock says, take it up with Starfleet, assuming we live to ever see a starbase again. Right. And he threatens to arrest him. And for a moment, Decker thinks Spock might be bluffing, but Vulcans don't bluff. So <laughs> he yields command back to Spock. And there's a great moment in the musical score. There's a very like triumphant phrase that mm-hmm. plays as Spock retakes command. And he's like, get your ass to the sick bay <laughs> to be evaluated yes. for medical. <laughs> you, you madman. And second order of business, we're turning back to pick up Kirk, Scotty, and the UCs, assuming they can stay ahead of the beastie. Down in a hallway, Decker and Montgomery step out of a turbo lift, and Decker fakes a cough. Star Trek fight! And yeah. takes a swing at Montgomery. <laughs> They throw fists back and forth until finally Montgomery is down and Decker drags him into a room off the hallway. <laughs> the whole time during this fight, I kept looking at the carpet and thinking, someone needs to vacuum the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. Because, uh, <laughs> you know, like when you're a kid and you, like your mom would vacuum in the pattern and yeah. wouldn't want anyone to step on it. And <laughs> and I'm like, oh, look at these scuff marks are driving me nuts. Someone vacuum that carpet. That reminds me of... Do you, do you remember the meme that goes around that's uh, it's a picture of the Enterprise D bridge and the lights are kind of dim and there's a guy with a vacuum cleaner and it, the, the <laughs> caption is like, go to space, they said. Join Starfleet, they said. It'll be fun, they said. No, <laughs> and it's I like a third, it. third shift crewman vacuuming the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Decker's climbing down ladders and sneaking around the ship, trying to avoid the crew, and he emerges on the shuttlecraft hangar deck. Both ships are headed for rendezvous now, and Sulu picks up an unauthorized opening of the shuttle bay doors, and it's too late for Sulu to override. Kirk's picked this shuttle launch up from the Constellation, too. They ring the shuttlecraft, and Decker answers, and he's like, you were right, Spock, and Spock's like, of course I was. (laughs) <laughs> and, De- and I told you. <laughs> no, Decker says, there's no way to blast through the hull of that beastie, so I'm going to kamikaze right down its throat. This reminds me of, um, I know you've seen this movie, Independence Day. Oh, yes. And, and this whole ending was like, this is Independence Day. <laughs> All right, you alien assholes. In the words of my generation, up your- Kirk is on the party line now, and he and Spock both try to talk Ahab out of this. Ahab says he's been ready to die since he killed his crew. He should have been killed with them, actually. Mm -hmm. So he's still up in his feelings. And Kirk keeps trying to talk him off the ledge, but Decker hangs up the phone. And as the shuttle enters the beastie, Ahab dies in screaming agony. Oh my God, they've killed- Commodore Decker. You bastards! Spock calls up Kirk again and says, Sir, may I offer my condolences on the death of your friend? It is most regrettable. Aw, Spock. Oh, stop. He, he, inside, he's like, yeah, that fucker. <laughs> <laughs> and Kirk responds, it's regrettable that he died for nothing. Maybe not for nothing, though. 
Sulu picked up a slight drop in power when the shuttle exploded, but very slight, and the beastie is still chasing them, draining their power. Transporters are back online now, but Kirk's not ready to leave yet. We've got two Constitution-class starships, and there's only room for one on this TV show. (laughs) So, So the UCs beam back to the Enterprise, and Kirk and Scotty get to work. They are going to pilot the starship, and they're going to explode it within a 30-second delay before (laughs) detonation. They're going to try to get out. Kirk tells Spock that maybe Decker didn't die for nothing and asks if he's correct in assuming that a fusion explosion of 97 megatons will result if a starship impulse engine is overloaded. And Spock's like, No, sir. 97.835 megatons. 97.835. I guess Spock's got a Spock. And Spock's like, I thought we've been through this before. The hull is pure neutronium. You can't blast through it. And Kirk says, not from the outside, Spock. I'm going to explode inside. Oh, my. Giggity, giggity, (laughs) goo. There's a funny interaction with Kirk and Scotty here, too. Uh, Kirk's like, can you rig the impulse engines to overload? And Scotty says, I... The shape the thing's in, it's hard to keep her from blowing. (laughs) (laughs) I love Scotty, too. Oh, I love him so much. So they're going to rig up this 30-second delay detonator in auxiliary control so that Kirk can pull the trigger from there. Spock checks in. There's no way to scan the interior of the beastie and cautions that the constellation is getting dangerously close to it. And Kirk says, I plan to get a lot closer, Spock. I'm going to shove this thing right down its throat. And Spock shows some concern again here. He's like, Jim, you'll die just like Ahab. And Kirk explains the 30-second delay thing, but even that doesn't make Spock feel better about the odds. Spock's concerned that the explosion won't work at all and that the transporters aren't working 100% yet, so there could be complications in beaming them back. Scotty <laughs> Talk shows- about drama. <laughs> Scotty shows up in the middle of this phone call and he's like, hold on. The transporters aren't repaired yet. (laughs) You've got to be mad. But, you know, he very quickly kind of gets over that to explain how this delay detonator works on the nearby console. Kirk calls Spock back and sends Scotty back to the Enterprise. It's all up to Kirk now. The transport does not go well. Scotty phased in and out a few times and Kyle explains there's a power drain somewhere. So Scotty heads off to fix the problem, and we get a quick cut to him inside a Jeffrey's tube where there's, like, sparks flying everywhere. And is he setting those um, little (laughs) magnet things? Whatever they do, it's fixed so many things in the past. But he's setting those magnets inside the Jeffrey's tube. Sulu gets the job of counting down again because that's he always gets the countdown. Yep, He loves the countdown. Wait a minute, though. Where's McCoy? We don't see him again. No, he's in sick base, I assume, doing his job. <laughs> but it's just strange that <laughs> we don't see him. He's in sick bay yeah, drinking. He's drinking. Yeah. Um, I but, started to write here that Scotty MacGyvered the transporter system, but I think it's unfair that MacGyver got the credit for the bailing wire and duct tape and not Scotty. We should yeah, be MacGyver saying somebody Scotty the thing. Yeah. Yes, MacGyver actually Scottied it. So Scotty has Scottied the transporter, but the fix won't hold for long. Time is of the essence. 12,000 miles in closing. Here are miles again, not kilometers. 500 miles. Kirk flips a switch. Kyle energizes, but the transporter pad smokes again. A lot of tension building here at the end of the episode. As the clock is running out and Sulu gets the job of counting down again. <laughs> Scotty's up in a Jeffrey's tube trying to fix the transporter again. Six, five, four. We see the constellation explode first, and I love that choice. It's common in situations like this, but it really does create that like edge of your seat waiting to find out what happened. Did they get him? Did they not? Did you get him? Did you get him? Yeah. Uh, I also noticed there, and this is the remastered effects, but like after this thing blew up, it looked like this BC was throwing up. Like, projectile vomiting out of its mouth yeah it was like the blue light and like (laughs) (laughs) he's basic and then the light on the inside of it goes dark oh my god they've killed the planet killer you bastards kirk finally rematerializes on the transporter pad and runs out in the hallway as kyle exclaims we got him that was good tension good tension at the end yeah they really built it up 
Our button on the episode, on the bridge, Spock and Sulu are watching the planet killer drift aimlessly in space, dead. Kirk laments Commodore Ahab's death, although he notes sacrificing your life to save others isn't the worst way to go. Spock presumes that Kirk's report will show Commodore Ahab died in the line of duty. Probably no mention of that whole he kind of commandeered the Enterprise thing. Yeah, he's always kind to people. It wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter. He's dead. So there's right. no point in, in sullying his name. And Kirk muses that in the 20th century, the H-bomb was the ultimate weapon, their doomsday machine. And we used something like it to destroy another doomsday machine. How mm-hmm. fucking meta. Yeah. Spock can't help wondering if there are more of these weapons wandering around the universe. But Kirk's had enough. And that's the end of our episode. (laughs) Boy, I'm sure glad that's over with. I'm happy the affair is over. Me too. A most annoying, emotional episode. Yeah, but you know, I learned something today. When dreams become more important than reality, you give up travel, building, creating. One jealous god, if all this makes a god. By sparing your helpless enemy, who surely would have destroyed you, you demonstrated the advanced trait of mercy. Frankly, I was rather dismayed by your use of the term half-breed. You must admit, it is an unsophisticated expression. Is this one of these overt ones where they'd like literally said, hey, we're talking about the dangers of nuclear weapons. I didn't I didn't. Get uh, you that. didn't get that? I totally got no. it. They started it off with the H-bomb. They, they wrapped it up with the H-bomb. No, well, I guess so. This, this episode came out in 1967. So okay. so recently we've had like the first H bomb test was 1952. The Cold War is raging on. The Vietnam War is raging on. The Cuban Missile Crisis was only like five years prior to this episode. Mm-hmm. So I I think war was on the public consciousness during this time, and I I I really took away like, hey, we're ta- we're talking about the Doomsday Machine being. The weapon that would kill both sides in a in a conflict because it's just mm-hmm. that powerful. I kind of took away the fact that all of these soldiers that die are because the leaders are having a pissing contest. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And the way that Decker kind of went mad with power at the end, he was so blinded by revenge that he was willing to almost do it again with somebody else's ship. Yeah, and it's just the what the way that like leaders people who are in power like order the people underneath them to do things and it's really not necessarily i mean it is it is their fight in a way but but they're being sent to certain death Mm -hmm. and you know it's it's at the the leader's behest yeah and that's kind of what i saw and that's why i really hated decker Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and then there's also we kind of talked about this as we were going but the the parallels with Moby Dick and Captain mm-hmm. Ahab and revenge and, you know, just like in Moby Dick, Decker's obsession with revenge leads to his death in that in the final confrontation. So there's a lot yeah. of parallels. Sometimes you got to run away. No one. You got to know. When to <laughs> no, no when to when fold to fold I mean, <laughs> and you got so you can live to fight another day and don't yeah. be so trigger happy and set on on. You want to be on a suicide mission, fine, but don't take the people that yeah. don't don't yeah. want to be on a suicide mission. Yes. Yeah, it's their choice. It will. He's taken that choice away from them. Which he did in the end by yanking a shuttle and. Well, I and I, I was like, way. good, yeah, good, yeah, because that's yeah, yeah, and goodbye. Yes, farewell. <laughs> well, speaking of the dead, we should take a moment to pause and honor them, whether we like them or not. It's dead, Jim. We are assembled here today to pay final respects to our honored dead. We're going to say goodbye to Decker. Yes. War can often be a pissing contest between leaders. Command calling the shots and the soldiers are the bleeders. Decker came to his senses, stole a shuttle, and finally showed a spine. His last words... A commander is responsible for the life and death of his crew, and I should have died with mine. He flew straight into the space worm's mouth in a fiery goodbye, 
Rest in peace. Fuck that guy. <laughs> yes. I was pissed when I I was like, oh. Uh huh. Yeah. All right, let's pay the bills. Let's get right to business. Fine, I'm authorized to pay an equitable price. Federation has invested a great deal of money in our training. They're about due for a small return. Listen, we pay our percentages. We're entitled to a little service for our money, huh? Is this the way your citizens do business? They write a petition. They pay their percentages and the boss takes care of them. (laughs) Is there anything else? There are a lot of great ways to support the show here. Uh, One of the free ways to do that is to give us a rating and review wherever you listen to the show. Share it out with your friends. uh, Tell people about it. And, uh, of course, one of the best ways to support the show, though, is to give us some of your Federation credits by becoming a patron of the show. We want to thank our founding admirals. So special thanks to Russell, Allie, Peter, and Sarah D. Thank you so much for supporting the show and to all of our patrons. Thank you. This is... uh, this is such a cool thing that we get to do, that we can hang out and talk Star Trek Thank with, you. with our friends and that you enjoy it and feel like you want to support us. Thank you so much. Yep. Patrons get early access to every episode. There's merch at various levels. There are uh, a couple of special patron-only episodes that you can't get on the main feed. So head on over to patreon.com slash humanist trek. Pledge as little as $3 a month. It will really go a long way to supporting the production of this show. I assume you're loitering around here to learn what efficiency rating I plan to give your cadets. Trainees, to the briefing room. Is that all you got to say? What about my performance? Aren't you dead? I don't believe this was a fair test of my command abilities. There was no way to win. There's no correct resolution. It's a test of character. Now, what is that supposed to mean? I am understandably curious. May I ask you a question? Who's been holding up the damn elevator? Becca has rejoined us now for the answer to this week's question for the Doomsday Machine. Remind us all, what was the question? Out of George Takei, James Doohan, and Leonard Nimoy, whose favorite episode is this and why? Okay. Allie said this was George Takei's favorite episode. I said Jimmy Doohan, and neither of us had any idea why. Yeah. Possible four I'm... four points possible. <laughs> we know we're not getting one. Did either yeah. of us get this correct? Sarah, you would be right with James Doohan. Woo! Mm-hmm. So you Why get eight points. Why was this point. his favorite episode? Because um, well, he got to go on an away mission? Well, I have the answer if you just shut up for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> God. <laughs> this is James Dewan's favorite episode for its highlighting of the engineering aspects of the Star Trek oh, world. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very yeah. engineer heavy. Okay, that makes sense. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, next week, we're going to be reviewing mm-hmm. Cat's Paw, season two, episode seven. Aliens on a mission of conquest hold the crew captive. Which could literally apply to like a third of all Star Trek episodes. I don't even know what the fuck <laughs> yeah, that means. I it's don't very remember. general, yeah. I don't remember this episode at all. Oh. What's our question for Cat's Paw? Luckily, you don't need to know the map episode oh, to know the God. answer. <laughs> so apparently okay, there are cats in this episode, or a cat at least. Is this the one where the cat, where the lady is a cat and turns back and no forth? No idea. Anyway, the question is, <laughs> one of the cat's roars from this episode was recycled as the trademark growl for what famous video game villain? Video game villain. Well. Video game villain. It has a cat roar. Obviously, it's not a tiger, so it's a. Uh, uh, oh, what if it was the tiger from that episode where? Video game, though. Oh, video game. No, I'm, I'm high. <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> I don't know a video game that has a cat in okay. it. Okay. No, this is my guess. My guess is it's not a cat. My guess is, and I'm, and this is only because we just went and saw the feature film recently. Uh, it's Bowser from Mario. That's my guess. I'm trying to remember a video game back in our day, but it had a cat in it. I don't fucking know. Like, uh, I know it wasn't like Mortal Kombat or anything. No, but it could have been a growl from anything. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily a cat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll give you a hint. It wasn't used right away. So. So it was a, a okay. Wasn't used right. So I don't this remember. was filmed in what year? I'm just saying it wasn't. Like, oh, it wasn't yeah, like right. they turned around it was and from said, an "Oh, here." Old video game. It's not necessarily an old video game. <clears throat> I'm gonna. I don't know. I'll say. I'm gonna have to Wolfenstein or um um. I don't know. I know it's not. It can't be Mortal Kombat. 
Man, I so, loved yeah. Wolfenstein. That was a great game. I, that was awesome. It's so, it's so Be- different. Between now. that and Doom. Oh yeah. I Doom. played the crap the out of those games. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I'll say Wolfenstein, but I have no clue. Okay. Well, we will find out the answer to this question on next week's episode. If you'd like to play along, head out to your social medias and shoot out your answer with the hashtag Starfleet Challenge. And we'll pick a winner, something that we like and think is funny or whatever. Uh, or the only person to respond. Uh, that might be you too. Next time on Humanist Trek, Star Trek, the original series, season two, episode seven, Cat's Paw. Live long and prosper. Kapla. Humanist Trek is available wherever you replicate your podcast. Follow us on all the social medias at Humanist Trek. Become a patron at patreon.com slash humanist trek. Open hailing frequencies to podcast at humanistrek.com and visit our website, humanistrek.com. Humanist Trek is a production of Sarah Austin Media.